I'm Heather Hirschfeld, a professor in the English department at the University of Tennessee, and I'm here with three of my students to talk about the introduction to the new Cambridge Shakespeare Hamlet. My name is Ray Bernola. I'm a junior at the University of Tennessee in the English department, and my focus is creative writing. I'm Laura Chadwick, and I am a junior at the University of Tennessee in the English department with a focus in literature. I'm Brooke Dedman. I'm a senior at the University of Tennessee studying English with a concentration in creative writing. As you know, Hamlet has fascinated audiences for centuries, but it also makes serious demands on spectators and readers alike. Mm -hmm. An introductory essay is meant to help make sense of some of the puzzles the play presents, like Hamlet's antic disposition or Ophelia's drowning. Um, now that you've studied the play for a while, I'm wondering what you want in an introduction and what elements of the new Cambridge Shakespeare Hamlet uh, may have met what you were looking for. So for me, I think as a student, I'm always looking for something to expand my knowledge or enhance my thinking and the way I view a play. That's why I'm studying Shakespeare. Uh, so for me, uh, the critical responses section was really incredible in this introduction. Being able to see what other scholars have interpreted and been able to pull from the play was incredible for my own way of thinking about it. And they do so through so many different lenses, uh, cultural materialism, religious history, feminism. So it was just really cool to see that. Um, there's a psychoanalytical approaches section, for example, that talks about all these different interpretations of Hamlet's delay in killing his uncle, which I thought was super cool because that's a really hot discussion topic. And so grappling with things like that, for me, it was so much easier to develop thoughts about it, develop my own interpretations, having that scholarly foundation as kind of a springboard for what I'm going to think about. Yeah. Yeah, so I believe that having a grasp of the historical context of Shakespeare's time is extremely helpful. And that context can be social, cultural, or economic. For me, I was particularly interested in the English Reformation and religious issues of the time. And this introduction offered different accounts of how doctrines may have influenced Shakespeare. Um, so knowing that context gave me a deeper understanding of what the audience may have known when hearing of the spiritual questions that the play presents, um, questions regarding um, the afterlife and the complexity of the ghost. For me, what's really important are the different Shakespearean versions of each play that actually comes out. Uh, for example, with Hamlet, we have Quarto One, Quarto mm -hmm. Two, and then the Folio. I hadn't realized that Quarto One was actually about half the size of Quarto Two and yeah. the Folio. And these differences in language and length are like really, they really impact how different audiences and different critics view Hamlet. Mm -hmm. uh, if y'all want to turn with me to an example that I actually have in our Hamlet okay. on Act One, Scene Five. So the ghost says, I find thee apt and duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed that rots itself in ease on leafy wharf. Uh, this is actually different in Q2 and Q1 where the line reads that roots itself in ease on leafy wharf. That's a really important difference because that really hits on whether or not you're looking at this as a theme of decay for young Prince Hamlet mm -hmm. or if you're looking at it as like him rooting himself in his ideals and how he wants to play on in the rest of the play. Yeah. 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 Uh, I had so much fun with you guys when um, we studied that line in class and uh, <laughs> chose which one we would do, use as, as editors. So I'm glad that that appealed to you. I'm glad all these other elements appealed to you. I'm wondering if there were aspects of the introduction that you weren't expecting um, that appealed to you for the way you hadn't anticipated that information. Yeah, I, I was blown away by how rich the performance history is mm -hmm. and by how many different ways that um, the directors and the actors have chosen to play Hamlet and other characters like Gertrude and Ophelia. Mm -hmm. um, I also loved how while reading, I was able to see these fantastic images of different adaptations throughout the years. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, I mean, especially the women that were playing mm -hmm. Hamlet, mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, it's 
the complete opposite I mean, from Shakespeare's time where men were playing all of the roles. Yeah. It's such a great point, Laura. And um, I remember when I was doing some of the research on women playing Hamlet, um, how touched I was by how important it was for women um, to be able to perform this canonical role. And it also made me think in new ways about Hamlet's own sense of his femininity. Exactly, yeah. Actually, in the introduction, Charlotte Shark, the first woman to play Hamlet in the lead role in the late 18th century, uh, that really, really drew my attention. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't again until the late 19th century that Sarah Bernhardt was able to play Hamlet in the lead role, where she not only directed and produced Hamlet, but she also got to be Hamlet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Critics gave her more of an immature and more of a adamant and rash um, response to it, and they... This changed completely how critics viewed Hamlet and the audiences uh, sort of saw this in the play. I know personally when I read Hamlet that I saw Hamlet as more of a child, more of an immature, rash person. And so I think that Sarah Bernhardt made an amazing milestone. Again, I think it's about having all of these different points of views, these different interpretations, these different takes on Hamlet. Uh, in the performance history, what really drew my eye was the mention of Jonathan Price's performance mm -hmm. in the 1980s. Um, he played Hamlet and also voiced the ghost in Act One. So on stage, he would change his expressions and his mannerisms and his voice so that it was like the ghost was actually possessing Hamlet, mm -hmm. which is not only impressive to think about theatrically, but also I think it gives a great nod to the psychological complexity of the play to have that father-son conflict within Hamlet literally as one single person yeah. is crazy. I never would have thought of that. Focusing on that particular interpretation should remind us um, of the efforts that directors, actors, readers, critics have gone to to think about this play in new ways, to participate in a big global conversation about Hamlet. And I'm hopeful that, the, um, that this introduction uh, offers others a way into it as well.